story slides. Thank you. Welcome to the keynote presentation session of the 7th Sanem Annual Economist Conference. And we are starting this conference with today's keynote presentation session. We are delighted to have Professor Joe Louis Arkand, President of the Global Development Network, as the conference keynote speaker. To tell very, very briefly about Professor Arkand, uh, he's a professor of economics at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, as well as an affiliate professor at the uh, at the University uh, Mohammed VI Polytechnic in Rabat. He is a founding fellow of the European Development Research Network, EUDN, and is senior fellow at the FERDI, and has been a visiting professor at Renmin University of China in Beijing, uh, and then and several universities in Africa and Caribbean. He was assistant and then associate professor at the University of Montreal and professor at the CERDI in, in France. Professor Arkan holds a PhD in economics from the MIT and MPhil from Cambridge University. So today, Professor Arkan will be speaking on econometrics from the sky, how remote sensing data can help democratize development research. And we are extremely grateful to him uh, for giving this keynote address. Uh, and uh, in the context of today's, uh, in the conference on the major theme of uh, this conference, I think this keynote address will be very much helpful uh, in getting a better of this issue. So before I give the floor to Professor Arkant, a few housekeeping issues. Uh, during the open discussion session, participants can either write their questions or comments in the chat box or make a brief intervention. Uh, if you request for a brief intervention, uh, kindly uh, unmute yourself. Uh, I, when I allow you, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, you can open your video and you can make a very brief uh, intervention. So I'll also invite a few participants to share their thoughts. In particular, we are very delighted to have Professor Wahidin Mahmood uh, as the special guest of this session. And Professor Wahidin Mahmood is an eminent economist. He was a professor at the Department of Economics at Dhaka University, and he has many other affiliations. But uh, on, in addition to uh, many affiliations, he also served as a board member of the Global Development Network. So we are extremely happy to have you, sir. Thank you so much. I know you have some difficulties, but uh, we will be very happy if you remain with us in this whole session. So with this, I now welcome Professor Arkan to take the floor and make his presentation. Over to you. Thanks, Selim. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. I wish that I could be in Dhaka, uh, but inshallah, I'll be able to come to Dhaka at some point very, very soon. So I, 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 how could I, you know, I'm honored and privileged to be able to, to, to give this presentation today, but how could I not? I mean, Selim is, is on my board, so uh, I serve at his pleasure. Uh, he's one of my bosses. So it's, uh, thank you for the, thank you for the invitation. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is the use of remote sensing data, in particular NTL. So that's the acronym that you're going to be hearing an awful lot today. NTL is nighttime luminosity. Uh, and how the use of remote sensing data, such as NTL, I really believe is, is a game changer in terms of what we do in, in development economics. Uh, and so I think this is something which fits in nicely with the theme of, uh, of Sanem. Um, I'm going to divide my presentation into three uh, three pieces. Uh, the first part is going to be on using uh, NTL, nighttime luminosity, and then I'll start just saying using the acronym NTL uh, for impact evaluation, which as you uh, most of you are aware of, uh, has become something of a cottage industry in our profession over the past uh, 15 to 20, 15 to 20 years. Uh, and I think that uh, NTL is something which can help break what I see as a harmful monopoly of institutions such as um, IPA and, uh, and J-PAL, et cetera. I mean, I'm an MIT product, so I should love J-PAL, but I think they've done, to a certain extent, some harm to our, to our, to our profession, especially in the developing world. I'll come back to that later on. Um, Although I do have a lot of my PhD students who've, who've, who've worked for J-PAL and, and IPA, I think it's it's a great, you know, being a slave of uh, J-PAL or IPA is a great experience and something which looks good on a CV. But anyway, 
I'll get back to that. So the first part is, is going to be impact evaluation. I'm going to give you an example from an impact evaluation that I was uh, that I that I directed for several years in the Kingdom of Morocco. Um, the second example I'm going to give comes from the work that I'm currently pursuing uh, on sort of you know big macro issues and how in this case it's 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 basically the the the, the celebrated paper by Achimoglu, Johnson and Robinson that a lot of you or most of you are probably aware of on reversal of fortune. And then how NTL can actually help us to, 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 to you know to pick that pick that pick that apart to a certain degree. Uh, again, with all the respect that I, that I have for uh, Daron and, uh, and 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 his co-authors. Uh, and then third, I want to use I want I want to talk about using uh, NTL uh, for a policy analysis. And here uh, I'm going to give you an example of work that I've been carrying out uh, with collaborators uh, on. Um, the impact, the economic impact of uh, the current situation in, uh, in in Gaza. So some of you may find this uh, also, I think, interesting from the from the current affairs uh, perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to share my. Uh, so this should now. Let's make sure that this is all working properly. Um, so let me just go to uh, to the view to uh, full screen. Do you now have this in full screen? Can I, uh, I have yes, confirmation? we have. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And and as uh, as Salim said, so uh, I let me let me qualify even what he said. So the, the way I see myself is is as a recovering academic. I've been an, been an academic for uh, for longer than I can say for more than three decades. And I'm currently the uh, the president of GDN of the Global Development Network. But as you can see, I, I still haven't recovered completely from being an academic because this presentation is not written in PowerPoint. It's uh, it's LaTeX. It's done in Beamer, which is sort of one of the typical things that academics do and that non-academics uh, wouldn't touch with a with a ten foot pole. Um, and I'll, I'll mention the people who uh, who who helped uh, who were associated with all of this research uh, at uh, at the end because there's a host of people who have been involved in this. So um, let me let me. I'll, I'll come back to other forms of of remote sensing data. Let me let me start off right away with what's available out there and why this democratizes development research. So NTL data is there, there's various sources, uh, but the main source that people have been using now for actually more than a decade is uh, provided by our friends at NASA, uh, our American uh, the American Space Agency. And all of these data are free. Uh, that's that's the key thing here, and that's also why it democratizes things. Simply for the for the simple reason that it's free. And this stuff has been around actually for a long time. Let me just show you the the, the stuff that's been around. So we have the DMSP uh, OLS stuff, which goes back all the way to 1992, uh, and it goes up until 2000 uh, 2013. Uh, the resolution wasn't great on this. Uh, it, the pixels were basically 2.7 by 2.7 kilometers, but I'll, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures also of, of resolution. This is going to be a picture-heavy uh, presentation. Uh, and and then in 2012, the VIRS came uh, came online, uh, and and that uh, has remained the standard for an awful long time. And the the latest product, which has come out of uh, has come out of uh, NASA, is uh, Black Marble. So if you if you Google Black Marble. I'll give you some 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 Google references, uh, you know, some, some rather some HTTPs that you can go and look this stuff up on. The, the the only thing is you'll just need a large hard drive, okay? But given that you know that one terabyte hard drives uh, cost nothing these days, um, again, that should not be a that should not be a a, a restriction. The other thing is uh, to be able to to be able to do this. Everything that I'm going to be showing you in the in this presentation, absolutely everything was done with op in open source. Okay, so I, I tend to work uh, with R. Uh, so the the Treaty of Tordesillas. My wife happens to be an economist too. So she's she's a, she's I guess a conservative. She still works in Stata. Uh, about 15 years ago, I more than 15 years ago, 16 years ago, I converted over to R. So everything that I'm going to show you is basically done in uh, in, in in open source. Um, this is just gives you an example of the difference in, in resolution. So this is from your neighbors uh, in, in in India. So this is this is a this is a view 
uh, for, of, of New Delhi and uh, the, uh, the, the region around Delhi. And you can see on the left is the DSP OLS with the 2.7 kilometer. And then on the right, you have the Veers, and black marble is actually even better than Veers, but you can see the difference, right? You can see how much clearer the picture on the right is uh, to, the, uh, to, to what's on the, uh, uh, on the left. The other thing is that Veers uh, and black marble, black marble is essentially the, 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 the algorithm that the data go through, uh, is something which is available on a daily basis. And I'm going to be giving you an example of that in the third part of the presentation when I'm talking about the, the, the Gaza war, where we actually are using daily data uh, to, uh, to, to evaluate the economic impact of the, of, of, of the current, uh, current situation in, uh, in Gaza. Um, the difference between VERS and black marble, uh, that's what's shown in this table, is essentially black marble is state of the art. Uh, there's, there's uh, it you know, takes into account snow and moonlight and uh, it, it, there's, there's a whole algorithm. Again, you can, you, you, you'll see the reference down there under the, uh, under the table. I, I invite you to go and look at the NASA website uh, and uh, you'll, you'll, it's it's fairly easy. There's some there's some self taught tutorials that you can do also uh, on this. Uh, and uh, when you write emails to the NASA people, believe it or not, they actually answer you, uh, which is which is rare in the world of of research. There's some real scientists there, and they actually answer you. And it really doesn't matter where your email is coming from. I mean, I've had students of mine in China. Uh, and in Morocco, write to them, they get an answer. It isn't just people based in the U.S. who are going to get, get an answer. So NASA, at least, is, is very open-minded about, uh, they just want people to use their data. So um, let me start off uh, also with where this comes from. So the, the, the first thing, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, NTL, about, about nighttime luminosity. So this has a really weird metric Okay, then most of us are not aware of the of the of the metric. It's it's measured. Luminosity is measured in nanowatts per square centimeter per steradium. Okay, that's that's a real mouthful. Um, that's that's the unit of measurement, but it basically is what you see on a on a on a map. And the seminal paper on uh, on the use of NTL was this paper by Henderson, Storygard, and Vile in the American Economic Review uh, twelve years ago. Uh, and that sort of basically was the was the first paper that really started taking NTL uh, seriously as uh, a proxy for economic activity. Because the simple fact is, and I'll show you pictures of this. I'll show you some correlations in a in, in a couple of seconds. Um, it's it's just a wonderful measure of, of of economic activity, and it isn't just the measure of electrification. Um, you know, I've used this in places in West Africa where there is no electricity. You see electron, you, you see rather, you see uh, economic activity even when there's you know gas lights in in street markets uh, outside. Uh, so it isn't just a proxy for electrification; it's a proxy for uh, economic activity, both at the the micro level, and I'll be showing you evidence of this, uh, and at the uh, at, at the macro level. So then there was this gel article, a Journal of Economic Literature article, this this one by Donaldson and Storyguard again, which you could go. I, I suggest that these are these are sort of my suggestions on how you can get into this literature. And then our friends at the uh, International Monetary Fund, there's this uh, really nice working paper by Hu and Yao, and they get into some of the the sort of the subtle nonlinearities actually of the um, of the, the the correlation between NTL and, and various measures of of, of of economic activity. So uh, what you have then below are some web resources if you're interested in this. Again, I'm sure that uh, Salim can uh, can make this available to people if they want to, you know, the 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 the, uh, the the presentation. If people then want to go and look the HTT, HTTPS is up. So there's this stuff on black marble. There's how you you use this, you know, how you do this in in, in Python, Google Earth, and then there's just another. The, the last one is just another uh, a bunch of really nice pictures because this is actually really cool. You can see a whole lot of things with the uh, with, with NTL that you don't see in in sort of standard economic data. So the the let me now start the, the the formal presentation per se. And the first thing I want to talk about, oh sorry, not yet. Let me let me show you some pictures. So here, for example, this is an example. I, I'm picking Morocco here for the simple reason that I'm going to be giving you a Moroccan example. So this is this is as if you look at this map, you'll see that you've got uh, Casablanca here, you have Marrakesh down down here, this up here, that's Rabat, the capital. 
And when you look at this with the naked eye, when you look at this picture, you say, ah, well, it doesn't seem to be much of a difference between, you know, a four year span. But it turns out that when you actually start running regressions at the pixel level, there's actually uh, huge differences between these two maps. They don't show up when you sort of look at it uh, at the naked eye over a four year span in a country like Morocco, but actually there are huge differences. And let me just show you at the at the macro level. So this is this again, just to take the Moroccan example, this is basically a plot of uh, 25 quarters of, uh, of GDP data uh, and the movements of, of, of NTL. In the dotted red line, you have, you have log GDP. Uh, the blue line, you have log NTL. As you can see, uh, NTL tracks the quarterly GDP data really, really, really faithfully. And this is something that you see uh, all over. This is like a time series plot, obviously, but this is something that you see uh, all over the world. And what's wonderful about this is, of course, that the NTL data, you can disaggregate it as you wish, right? You can disaggregate, it's, it's, it's available at the pixel level, but then you can aggregate it up either to larger pixels if you want or to administrative units, right? So depending upon the country that you're working in or on, uh, you can aggregate it up to, you know, municipalities or regions or provinces or states, you know, whatever you want to do. A lot of times this kind of data is not available uh, from national statistical agencies, but the NTL is always there. Uh, so uh, that, that's that's sort of just time series evidence. But this doesn't just work in time series. It actually also works in cross-section. So again, to give you an illustration of this, these are the countries in the... Um, in the uh, the Ashimoglu Johnson Robinson papers, the ones you know on former on former colonies, and this basically shows you GDP per log GDP per capita, in, you know, constant PPP GDP per capita on the horizontal axis, and then log luminosity per capita on the on the vertical axis. And as you can see, I mean you know, the the fit is pretty darn good for a cross sectional regression. This is sort of suspiciously good almost how good the uh, the, uh, the 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 fit is. Um, let me get right into the uh, in, in, into the presentation. So the first part of the presentation is on uh, uh, impact evaluation. So using NTL for uh, for impact evaluation. So uh, of course, you know, NTL is not going to be uh, the left hand side variable, your outcome variable, if you're looking at something like uh, child health or uh, you know maternal mortality. But when it comes to outcome variables, so the, so the left hand side of your equation, which is if it's something which is associated with economic activity, uh, it's it's a really, really good indicator. Um, so I've worked a lot, for example, on CDD, on community-driven development. So for community-driven development per se, uh, especially in places where I've worked uh, in, in, in West Africa, NTL would not have been my choice because what I was looking more at were things like child anthropometrics, nutrition. But if you're looking at economic activity, it's a really good proxy. And again, you can use this with any identification strategy that you choose. So as, as, again, most of you know better than I do, the four identification strategies that we should take seriously are, you know, RCTs. Uh, so that's our, the, you know, the JPAL IPA crowd. Uh, so randomized control trials. RDD, I'm going to give you an example using RDD, which is regression discontinuity design, which economists uh, rediscovered in 1999, though political scientists have been using it since the 1960s. Uh, it's based on a, it's, you know, RDD is based on discontinuity, right? And democracy works in most countries with 50% of the vote plus one, right? So you have a discontinuity. And if you go and look at old statistical uh, textbooks in political science going back to the 1960s, which I, I mean, they, they were fully aware of this. Anyway, economists uh, rediscovered this in a, a fairly well-known paper in the QJE by Angrist and Lavi, uh, looking at uh, the effect of class size on uh, on schooling outcomes in Israel, uh, but it's been around for an awful long time. Uh, so that's RDD. Uh, it'll it'll work with that. It'll work with with difference and differences. I'm going to give you an example of, uh, of of differences and differences when I talk about the the the, the Gaza bombing stuff that we're that we're doing, and of course it'll work with uh, it'll work with with instrumental variables. So the point is, uh, NTL is a tool. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to be your left-hand side variable uh, as an outcome, uh, your Y uh, in, in, in your equation, though it can also be used uh, very fruitfully to, to, to construct things, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, later on. 
Okay, so let me give you this example from Morocco. So the the, the example from, from Morocco is the uh, INDH. INDH is the acronym in French for Initiative Nationale de Développement Humain, which means the National Human Development uh, Initiative. And so this was a this this was actually is a, a very large program in Morocco. So the first stage of the program uh, from 2005 to 2008 uh, was one billion dollars. Now Morocco is a big country, but a billion is a lot of money, even in a big country like uh, like Morocco. And this was a program that uh, saw the light because the Moroccans, to caricaturize things. Uh, the Moroccans were getting more and more annoyed at the fact that they kept on slipping down the international uh, rankings in terms of the, the Human Development Index. Um, and so the, the, the king, Mohammed VI, uh, this, this is what he refers to this, this program as in French as his Chantier de Règne, which means basically one, you know, one of the main initiatives of his, of his whole reign. Uh, the people in the palace decided that they were basically going to do a CDD program, a community-driven development program. The, the twist in uh, in Morocco is that this was implemented by the Ministry of the Interior, which didn't have the best of reputations in Morocco, uh, especially under his father, under Hassan II, uh, because it was basically the you know the, the central government's police. What's 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 interesting here is how the the Ministry of the Interior has been completely transformed by this uh, by, by this program, and it operated as many CDD programs do. The World Bank has poured tens of billions of dollars into CDD programs around the world. In this case, the Moroccans didn't want the World Bank to touch this with a ten foot pole. Uh, this was a Moroccan Moroccan program. It was entirely driven uh, and everything by the by, by the Moroccans, and they they did not share their data, for example, with the with the with with, with the bank. Um, Anyway, the, the the way in which this worked, uh, the the deployment of the program was RDD, so it was a, a a regression discontinuity design. So the 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 HCP, uh, which is the Haut Commissariat au Plan, so it's basically the Moroccan statistical agency. It just happens to be a high commission in Morocco. They they constructed a poverty map. Uh, I'll come back to poverty mapping later on uh, in the context of Gaza. Uh, but as 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 again, as most of you are probably aware, poverty mapping is one of the most useful tools uh, that's been uh, that's been introduced into development economics in the past few decades, and it was introduced by uh, by the late uh, Jenny Lanyau and and her and her husband and Chris Elbers. Uh, so it's sort of a, a a Dutch product. And poverty mapping, as you as you know, combines um, household survey data with census data, right? So. Household survey data, you know, you can you can do a representative survey for a nationally representative survey of China of the P, of the PRC uh, with a with a sample size of twenty thousand people, and China is a big country, as you know. Um, but of course, uh, you will not have observations in every single county in China. Just to take the example of China. On the other hand, in census data, uh, you have every single household in the country, but you usually don't have income data. Uh, there may be exceptions, but I've worked in a lot of countries. I don't know any countries where census data actually includes income data. So what you basically do with the way poverty mapping works is you use your household survey data to run a model where you have a limited number of variables, which are available both in the household survey and in the census on the right-hand side, and you essentially model household income using that. And then what you do is you take that model, which you've estimated using the household survey data, and you ex use you plug in the right-hand side variables from the from the census data, and you get a noisy measure of household uh, income or expenditures, you know, whatever you're you're working with in terms of survey data for every single household uh, in the in the country. Okay, and so then you aggregate that up. It's a noisy measure. There's a standard error. You, you have to take that into account. There's lots of software available to do this. So like in R. There are at least two packages which do this. And so they did this for Morocco. And then for every rural commune, so um, there, there's, there's, there's a, I think it's something like 1,200 rural communes, in, which is the smallest administrative unit in Morocco. So they calculated a poverty rate. Okay, So they calculated the poverty rate, and they decided that every rural commune that, according to the 2004 poverty map of Morocco, um, had a poverty rate in excess of 30% of the households, that, that, that those, those rural communities would get the program. 
And those, if, if you had a 29.9% poverty rate in 2004, you would not get the program. Okay, so that's what determines treatment status in the first wave of the of the program. Now, you can buy and sell anything in, 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 in Morocco, but you cannot buy time travel, right? So there was no way to manipulate this because it was based on the 2004 poverty map, which had already been released publicly, uh, and they started basically treating and uh, you know the uh, communes with with the program in 2005. So there's there's no manipulation possible here. So let, let me show let me show you a picture. Okay, so the, the the result of this impact evaluation. So actually, our our basic identification strategy. We did a household survey. Uh, this was this was sort of the the dream impact evaluation for a development economist such as myself because. Uh, there was a whole agency called the ONDH, so the uh, Office National de Développement Humain, so the, the the National Human Development Office, which depended directly from the Prime Minister's office, which was basically charged with evaluating this program. So I had like complete free hand in doing this. It was it was a dream. It was it was just a, a pleasure, and I spent several years working on this. So we did RDD with household surveys and everything, but I wrote a little note for His Majesty the King uh, called. Yendeash from outer space, and this is the picture that that I showed them. So, what do we have on this on on this picture? So, what we have on this picture on the horizontal axis is what in RDD and in, in regression discontinuity design parlance is known as the forcing variable, which is the poverty rate. Okay, so the poverty rate at the rural commune level, uh, and it's centered on the thirty percent threshold. Okay. So when you look at zero, the zero on the horizontal axis, that's a 30% poverty rate at the rural commune level. So 10 is a 40% uh, poverty rate. Minus 10 is a 20% poverty rate. Okay. And on the vertical axis, what we have is the total luminosity. Uh, this is measured. This is the average for, for a given year uh, of uh, each rural commune. So each dot here, each little gray circle represents... Uh, and its vertical axis, the, the total luminosity of a rural commune in a given year. Okay, so this, 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 this as you can see, there's a, there's a heck of a lot of, uh, of, of rural commune, rural commune years. So there's 7,218 of them. And this is, this is uh, between uh, 2005 and 2010. And so then this is a, <laughs> this is sort of the standard RDD non-parametric regression. And so what you see around the threshold, you see how those two lines, so as you would expect, the average relationship between poverty and nighttime luminosity is decreasing, right? The higher the poverty rate, the less luminosity you have. That's why that curve is downward sloping. But what you notice at the 30% threshold, and there's a whole bunch of assumptions that have to be made. I mean, there's no other program which depends upon that 30% poverty threshold, okay? So that's where the identification in the econometric sense is, is, is coming from. And so what you can see is that there's a gap. There's a large gap, and that gap corresponds to a 19.6% a difference in luminosity, which we can attribute to the program, okay? So you could actually see, you could estimate, we, could, we, can, we can estimate the impact of this program uh, from outer space. Okay, and 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 this this particular graph this costs nothing. This costs absolute nothing. So talk about democratizing impact evaluation. This there's no there's no household survey. There's nothing at all which costs any money going into this apart from the fact of downloading the data, getting it in format, and then running your standard whatever package you want to use to run the RDD. Okay, and then of course if and I'll give you an example of this. If you want to convert this in this case, into dirhams, into the, the currency unit in Morocco or into U.S. dollars, then you need to have basically a conversion factor from nighttime luminosity into, into currency units. And I'll give you an example of that for, for, for Gaza. There you're going to have to use you know, poverty mapping or some sort of household survey data, probably poverty mapping. That's the way I, I, I do it. Uh, but the, you know, smart people will probably come up with other ways of doing this. But just in terms of looking at the impact, we could tell the king, my, my team and I, we could tell the king there's an impact, you know, nighttime, lumi your program has increased nighttime luminosity by almost 20% in a five-year five period. Now, what's interesting is I've gone back, given that this is costless to do, I've gone back and looked at the next phases of the program. This effect has completely disappeared. 
Okay, that's the other wonderful thing about NTL data is that given that it's a daily product and it just keeps on it just keeps on coming out, uh, you can go back years later and see if the impact of a given program if it's still there, right? Uh, which which is very expensive to do if you have to rely on household surveys. Uh, and unfortunately, in some sense, not unfortunately, in some sense, it's sort of inevitable. The, the the program impact has disappeared. What actually happened here, and I can tell you this from survey data, is that household incomes were increased an awful lot. Child health did not go, did not improve. Maternal mortality, which is actually very high in Morocco, did not particularly go down. Um, illiteracy, Morocco is a complete outlier internationally. It, it, it used to be the only country that I'm aware of which had a specific ministry uh, dedicated to illiteracy because they had they had a higher illiteracy illiteracy rate than a lot of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. What happened is that the 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 the, the households uh, they, they basically got a huge windfall from this program and they basically bought consumer durables, which increased economic activity in the short run. You know, they bought a fridge or a, or a gas cooker or something like that. It increased economic activity, but then the thing basically closed up. Okay, so this is an example of doing impact evaluation again with, at zero cost, uh, essentially. Let me move to the second part of the presentation, which has to do with sort of, uh, you know, sort of standard big picture macro theories. Okay, so there's this 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 really famous paper, one of the most highly cited papers in all of economics, in all of development economics, at least in the past in this century, by Ashimoglu. Uh, by Daron, uh, Chimoglu, Simon Johnson, and, and Jim Robinson in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Uh, the, the, the title is, you know, Reversal of Fortune. And so what's the basic story? Again, you, I don't actually agree with their identification strategy, but it's, it's still a brilliant story, okay? Uh, I, I don't agree with their, with their, uh, their identification strategy in the sense of the, the, the white settler mortality instrument, Right, that's the famous instrumental variable that, that that they use. I don't buy it, but it's still a great story. And God knows they know how to sell this stuff really, really well. They write, they write wonderfully, and I'm sure that uh, Daron Ashimoglu will get a will get a, a Nobel Prize uh, within the next uh, five years. I'll I'll bet I'll actually bet you on that, uh, Salim. Will uh, well, you probably agree with me on that. I I, I suspect. Um, so uh, this paper, basically, if you want sort of the, you know, sort of the, the, the comic book version of the paper, what it basically says is that countries that were poor in 50 X colonies, okay, this is all based on X colonies, okay? So and my passport says I'm Canadian. I'm born in the Cameroon, but my passport says I'm Canadian. So Canada is an X colony, right? Uh, so is the US, so is Australia, so is New Zealand, so is South Africa. So... X colonies that were rich in 1500 are poor today and vice versa. That's the reversal of fortune. Okay? So if you were poor in, in 1500, you're rich today. If you were rich in 1500, you're poor today. Okay? On average. Okay? And their measure of, because uh, of course we don't have GDP, you know, for 61 X colonies, between 59 and 61 X colonies and 62 X colonies in 1500, we don't have GDP per capita measures. They use a measure of urbanization. Okay, so they, they again, you, some of you, most of you probably will remember this paper vaguely. It's worthwhile going back and and taking a taking another look at this. So that's at the country level, right? And so traditional, the unit of observation is is the country, right? So you look at log GDP per capita today, and you you have a certain number of covariates, right? So you sort of get rid of the, the Jeff Sachs type type arguments in terms of geography. You get rid of that, right? And then you put urbanization in 1500. And well, surprise, surprise, you get a negative and highly statistically significant uh, coefficient. So what we do uh, is we take that, we take that idea and we go down and look at it at the pixel level. So how are we, how the heck are we going to do this? Well, it, first of all, uh, the left-hand side variable, instead of being GDP per capita or log GDP per capita, is going to be luminosity, okay? But it's going to be luminosity at the pixel level, and you'll see the number of observations we have, which means that we can go and look at things within country, okay? So that's that's the first thing that we can do. And then how, you ask me, do we say anything about, you know, population density 
in the 1500s at the pixel level. Well, it turns out there's a whole literature on this. So this 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 hide data H Y D E. So this is we use 3.2. I think they have a new version out, which I haven't worked on yet. But they have data going back estimates going back 12,000 level 12,000 years at the pixel level. Again, this is free. You can download all this stuff off the off the web. Uh, on land, population, built up areas, because our archaeologist colleagues are continuously updating this stuff. You know, a lot of archaeology today works through satellite data, right? I mean, just uh, I remember there was a New York Times article a few weeks ago, maybe it's a few months ago now, of uh, ruins that they've discovered in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Okay. And, and, and it's only thanks to satellite data that they can actually see this stuff. Okay. So let me just show you what happens in terms of the in terms of the results. And then I want to push this a little bit further to show you actually what you what more, what you know, why do this and, and what more you can get out of the, the disaggregated data at the at, at the pixel level. So here's you know sort of a standard standard table, you know, that you'd see in any any econ, any econ paper. So um, the, the the first stuff is at the country level. Okay, so columns one to seven, that's at the country level. And what the, the, the key thing is basically this negative coefficient. So you see log population, basically that's population density. So it's log population uh, divided by arable land. So you see in columns one, two, and three, that's basically for 91 countries. What, what it's doing here is it's essentially in the columns one and two, it's basically, that's just reproducing AJR. Okay, that's essentially reproducing AJR. Column one is actually AJR. That we, we just reproduce their result, of course. I mean, their data are available, so we get the same result as them. Column two basically takes, instead of the, the old 1995 data, it takes log GDP in, in 2016. And then column three does it with log luminosity capita. Okay, so you see, we, using the AJR right-hand side variable, we get basically exactly the same result. Okay, then in uh, column in column four, uh, what we do is we start using the hide data in terms of population by maximum land available. As you can see, this is still at the country level, okay? Um, and what we do uh, in column six and seven, see there's still 100 observations. What we do is we disaggregate the log population, uh, you know, per land, you know, by, by amount of land available. And you can just see that the, basically the, the negative stuff, the negative coefficient is coming from the population. Okay, so uh, what we do, whoops, what we do in columns eight and nine, look at what happens to the number of observations. The number of observations goes from 100 to almost 4,000. The reason it goes to 4,000 is that we're using the pixel level of 1.6, 1. 1. Um, uh, that's 1.6 uh, arc degrees, yes, arc degrees, by 1.6 uh, arc degrees. Uh, so that's why we have uh, three, you know, almost 4,000 observations. What you can see is that the coefficient is still negative and, and statistically significant, you know, small standard error. And then in columns 10 and 11, again, the left-hand side variable is log luminosity. The right-hand side variable is this, this, this measure of population, uh, the ratio of populate, log population to, 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 to land in 1500. Um, and what we do in columns 10 and 11 is it the pixel is even smaller. So there we actually have 1.2 million observations, okay? Because we have 1.2 million portions of the Earth which are covered by the by, by the high data. And, but you can see that we basically can reproduce the Achimoglu Johnson uh, Robinson result by switching the log GDP per capita on the left hand side, replacing that with a log luminosity per capita. Okay, and this holds up even if we, we've done this like with the 2024, not 2024, we've done it with 2023 data, it's, it, it's, it still holds up. So that's nice and robust. So, you know, Pache, AJR, right? Their result is robust. But what can we do now that we have the stuff at the pixel level? Well, we can go and basically see whether there's some kind of nonlinearity, geographically speaking, okay? And the way we can do that is that we can basically use what is known as geographically weighted regressions. Okay, so it's nice. R, for example, is very, very good when it comes to, to all types of non-parametric procedures. And geographically weighted regression is basically the same thing as running a non-parametric regression that you'd run in cross-sectional data, just that what you're allowing is you're essentially allowing the sign of the coefficient to be different in each pixel. 
Okay, and 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 there and and again to put it to put it in in very to simple to oversimplify it, there's basically it, this is sort of a penalized it's a penalized estimation where you know you you, you have to have a, a a big estimated change in the sign of the coefficient for it actually to, to to estimate that. Okay, so what's really important here, by the way, as with all of this this um, this spatial work. And there's and there's a huge amount of work that's been going on recently using using spatial data, satellite data, and other types of data. For those of you who've never got into spatial econometrics, I, it's really it's really fun, and there's a lot of stuff that you can do. You always have to check Moran's eye. That's basically a Durbin Watson. Okay, so we've all been taught, you know, with our we we've absorbed with our mother's milk as little economists. We have absorbed uh, Durbin Watsons. Well, Moran's eye is just basically a spatial. Uh, Durbin Watson. It basically, if you take two pixels which are next to each other, there's going to be a spatial correlation between the two. And the further you get away in terms of pixels, that you know that correlation goes down. And so again, the the the, the key reference. I think this has been published, and I put 2919, not published in 2919, published in 2019. Uh, the CPR paper by uh, by Morgan Kelly, uh, who's in uh, in Dublin. Uh, look, look at this, and you'll see how. Um, how fragile a lot of very famous papers are once you start taking into account spatial correlation. It turns out that a lot of really famous papers out there, including a couple of papers in Econometrica, they the results disappear completely once you start taking spatial correlation seriously. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I urge you to read that paper. Anyway, let me just show you maps of the results of this. Um, Here's here here's the geographically weighted regression in terms of the sign of the coefficient of the correlation between uh, the left hand side variable, which is luminosity per capita today. In this case, it's in in, in 2016, uh, and the, the 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 ratio of uh, log of population to the maximum amount of land available in 1500. Okay, so that's the measure in some sense of of urbanization of the population density in, in, in 1500. And what you see when we use the, the pixel at the 1.6 level is you can see that there's heterogeneity, right? So there's a lot of places, that's that's what's in, in, in sort of orange, where indeed the coefficient, orange is, is a negative coefficient, negative and statistically significant coefficient. Blue is a positive and statistically significant coefficient. And what you can see is, for example, there's a whole, there's a whole chunk of Latin America uh, where you actually have a positive correlation between population density in 1500 uh, and GDP per capita today. There are pockets in Africa also where you see this. When we go to the even smaller resolution where we had 1.2, over 1.2 million pixels on, on, on planet Earth, well, what you see is even like North America, you know, what I expected to see, and this is, this is ongoing work, what I expected to see was a difference between the southern and the northern United States, right? I expected sort of south of the Mason-Dixon line to see one result and north of the Mason-Dixon line, you know, sort of Confederate versus Union states. It turns out here, we see that, we see it entirely in a, it's, it's an east-west dichotomy, right? So if you look at the US and the right-hand side map, you can see that most of the eastern United States, the coefficient is negative, as in the AJR result, but the western United States, it's, it's the opposite. And then you see for, for a lot of Africa, for all these countries in Africa, the coefficient to a large extent is simply zero, statistically speaking. The correlation is basically zero. But then you have, as you can see here up, up here in the MENA region in, in, in North Africa, so in Algeria, Morocco, the coefficient is negative, uh, whereas when you get to, uh, you know, to, to Egypt, Libya, et cetera, the coefficient is positive. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna get into the details. I mean, we're, we have a, a whole paper on this, but the point that I'm trying to make again is using these free data, you can actually pick apart the, uh, the AJR story and start to find some really interesting things going on within country at, at, and the differences between different pixels in terms of the correlation between nighttime luminosity today and uh, our measure of population density uh, almost now, 550 years ago. Uh, let me skip this. Anyway, this 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 is basically shows you how how different these things, these coefficients are. Okay, let me get into the third and final part of my presentation, which has to do with using uh, NTL to look at uh, basically policy and current affairs. So this is work that that as you could see, this is this is this is really recent. As you can see, it's January 2024. 
So this is stuff. I've been working for a long time uh, with the uh, the Palestine unit at UNTAD, uh, which is like just obviously at UNTAD in, 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 in Geneva. Um, and so we've done we've done several reports. I've worked on several reports with the Palestine unit uh, on the cost of occupation. This is this is basically their their mandate. Uh, you have the the HTTP here. Uh, so this this is this is a this 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 paper here, which got a, a a heck of a lot of media traction, as you can imagine, given given what's going on these days. I think we were in something like 900 news stories, uh, CNN, Reuters, uh, etc. Uh, so the the paper here, uh, the HTTPS that you have here, this is sort of that's the UNCTAD publication. What I'm going to show you is what's going on under the hood. Okay, so I'm going to show you sort of the academic version of this. Uh, because obviously the German interested versions, and so let me show you how. And I'm, this is this is basically what I want to conclude with is is how you can use NTL in real time to say something about current events and to say something about, about policy. So here the, the the tools that we're going to be using there there's several tools. The first tools that we're going to be using so NTL. I'll get to NTL. I have a really nice picture of, of Gaza using NTL that you'll see in a minute. But the key tool here was uh, this this data, which is be which is put together and it's updated on a weekly basis. This is the Copernicus Sentinel One satellite, and it's uh, Corey Schur at the at the Graduate Center at CUNY and uh, Van den Hook at Oregon State University, and so. The, these are this is these are basically bombing maps. Okay, so these are bombing maps. The, the resolution of this stuff is astounding. It's forty meters by forty meters. Okay, so that you just you know th think of the size of forty meters by forty meters. Okay, so this is very very detailed. And so what we have uh, in the left map here is a map of Gaza, and then the the the, the little you know on the on the on the sort of the, the northwest right. That's that's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you know, south, south southwest is the Egyptian border, and then you have the Israeli border north and uh, and east and southeast. Uh, and each of those little red dots that means that that forty by forty meter pixel has been bombed. Okay. And so that corresponds, the left-hand side map corresponds from the 5th of October. As you know, the, 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 the tragic events in Gaza started with the Hamas attack on the, on the 7th of October. Uh, so this is from the 5th of October until the 22nd of November. And then from the 23rd to the 29th November, there shouldn't have been any bombing because there was a ceasefire in theory, but there was still bombing. Okay, that's the additional bombing that actually took place, the Israeli bombing during the, uh, during the ceasefire. Just to show you how detailed that is, let me zoom in on northeastern Gaza, on Gaza City. This is how detailed the stuff is. Okay, so this is this is this is Gaza City. Okay, as you can see, I mean, each of these each of these pixels, each of the, those those red dots corresponds to a forty meter by forty meter, uh, 40, 40 meter by forty meter pixel. Okay, so what we're going to do is. There's a, there's there's a, there's going to be a certain amount of econometric noise. What we're going to do is we're going to aggregate these data up to the one kilometer by one kilometer level. Okay, and that's what we're also going to do is we have to. This is one of the things that you have to learn to do with then with NTL data. Uh, you, you have, to, you have to learn how to how to work with different resolutions and how to resample stuff to change the resolutions to match the resolutions. So this is the bombing data basically aggregated up to the one kilometer by one kilometer area, okay? So that means that there's 625 of these 40 by 40 pixels that you saw in the original map, okay? So every one of those pixels, we're basically adding them up, okay? And the one kilometer by one kilometer, basically the color of those, of those one kilometer by one kilometer grids, that corresponds to the total number of pixels of the 625 pixels within that with within that one one by one kilometer grid cell which has been bombed okay so as you can see between october the 5th that's sort of the the, the this upper left hand side uh, map even between october 5th and, and november up, up up if you sort of stop on november the 22nd you can see that there are parts up there in gaza city basically where every single pixel 
within a given one kilometer by one kilometer pixel that has been bombed. Okay, so we we, we have stuff uh, new data which which isn't going to be in this presentation for all all the month of January, and you have some places. There are some places in Gaza City where 624 out of 625 40 meter by 40 meter pixels have been bombed since the beginning of the of the war. There's basically everything has been bombed. There's nothing. There's there's absolutely nothing left. So what we have here is play. This is so it's the same data as before. It's just aggregated up to the one kilometer by one kilometer level. Why are we aggregating it up to the one kilometer by one kilometer level? Because then we're going to match this with the same grid in terms of nighttime luminosity. Okay, and so what you can see is, so the, the upper left-hand one is, is up until November 22nd. Then we have the, the bombing maps, that's the ceasefire. So there was still some bombing going on within the ceasefire. The lower left-hand side map is the, uh, is the total damages, all of you know, it aggregates everything, right? Up until the end of the year, up until December, December 28th. And then this is the additional bombing between December 28th and January 5th. Okay, with what's going on in Rafa these days. So what we'd see is we'd see down here in Rafa, we'd see a heck of a lot of bombing going on now. That's 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 what's happening as 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 we speak, uh, basically. So how does this show up? Because you, you can see where this is going, right? What what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a diff diff, a difference in differences estimation here. What we do, uh, basically, where our left hand side variable is going to be NTL, is going to be nighttime luminosity at a given date, and then we're going to regress that on bombing. Okay, with with pixel specific effects, right? So we we basically absorb all of the time invariant pixel specific heterogeneity through the the fixed effects. It's actually slightly more complicated than that because there's a whole new literature in econometrics. It's actually in a special issue of the. It's it's in a. It's not a special issue. It's actually in one issue of the Journal of Econometrics. In this, in it's the June 2021 issue of the Journal of Econometrics on sort of front new estimators. Uh, for difference and differences where you have staggered treatment and bombing here is a staggered treatment, right? It isn't as if you have treatment and control, right? Uh, at a given time, it, it, different places get bombed at different moments. Let me show you the NTL, okay? Because it speaks for itself. Here's NTL, nighttime luminosity. You can see the, 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 the map of Gaza is superimposed in terms of these one by one kilometer grids, okay? So this is the same grids that I showed you for the bombing maps. Uh, yes, the, the the white lines that you see, those are the administrative units uh, within with, within Gaza. Okay, so there's basically the equivalent of uh, I can never remember if it's 32 or 33. I think it's 32. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 33 uh, administrative unit, like municipalities within within uh, within Gaza. And what you can see, so that the first map here, that's the night on the 5th of October. So that's that's before the Hamas attack. Okay. The second panel here, that's on 23rd of November. And what you notice is that a lot of stuff that was lit up, right? A lot of stuff that was lit up on, on the 5th of October before the event started. Well, a lot of this stuff has gone dark. And a lot of the stuff that's gone dark is, you see, around here. That's Gaza City. Okay, so most of Gaza City has already gone dark by the 23rd of November. Okay, on the 30th of November, it's, 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 it's got a lot worse. What you also notice is that stuff that was that was dark in the Rafa area, so near the Egyptian border, on the 23rd of November, by the 30th of November, that's starting to light, but light up, light up, because what's happening? People are moving southwest to Rafa, the stuff which is being bombed, uh, which is being attacked today. Okay, and so then you have the map 16th of uh, 16th of December, and we have the the maps going on, obviously, uh, up until. until uh, our last, uh, our last bombing map that we received from the people at, uh, at Cooney um, and Oregon State is, uh, I think it was February fifteenth. Okay, so I mean this, this is real time, right? And the NTL data we have on a daily basis. I mean, you can see here we're actually working on a daily basis. Here's the estimates. Okay, so we run a we run a, a, a diff diff. One of the things that you want to make sure with a diff diff is you want to make sure that you have par parallel trends, to put it very, very simply, okay? So the first two things, the first two, th this is basically the point estimate, okay? This is a placebo regression. So you don't want it to be significant. This is the 95%, uh, the, these are the 95% confidence bands, okay? So as you can see, if we run a placebo regression, there is no effective bombing, okay? 
what you see here is essentially, so it's the percentage change in NTL and nighttime luminosity. So what you can see just up until November 23rd, okay, so between October 7 and November 23rd, so what you have is minus 0.2. That's the point estimate, and that's the 95% confidence band, okay? So that means that there is a 20% reduction in nighttime luminosity on average in Gaza. There is a 20% reduction in nighttime luminosity, even if we just consider the bombing until November 23rd, okay? And so one fifth of the luminosity has disappeared on average because there's some places which on November 23rd still haven't been bombed, right? And there are portions of Gaza which are which are which are agricultural areas. Um, what's interesting is once you take the ceasefire into account, just to show you how sensitive this stuff is. So you you, you remember this picture, minus 20 percent, right? That's that's what you have in the in in this 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 the the, the third thing here. Okay, so here. I'm going to add in the ceasefire period. You see how the effect is is not as is not as negative. That's the effect of the ceasefire. It's it's no longer minus twenty percent. It's like minus fifteen percent. So that's that's the improvement in nighttime luminosity that comes from having a one week ceasefire. So this actually shows up at the pixel level on average in terms of nighttime luminosity. In terms of bombing intensity, what you also see is that there this this is actually originally this was a non parametric regression right, where we were allowing it to take any shape. And what you can see is the greater bombing intensity is, so the greater the proportion of 40 by 40, right, the number of 40 by 40 pixels that were bombed within the one by one kilometer, the, the greater the reduction in nighttime luminosity, right? So remember, there's a total of 625 of these pixels, right, of the 40 by 40 meter pixels within a one kilometer by one kilometer uh, sort of bigger bigger pixel you can see that if you wipe everything out so this is like 600 it's it's close to 625 you have almost a 40% reduction in luminosity okay so that's sort of the 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 upper bound of what you see in terms of uh, in in terms of the, uh, the 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 reduction in luminosity and 1 kilometer by 1 kilometer there's there's still a certain amount of bleeding right it sort of it bleeds over from one from one pixel to another we take into account you know the spatial correlation etc we do all the we use the usual econometric techniques here uh, but that that those are the that that's the that's the effect on ntl okay so we have an average effect turns out when we do this all the way to to to, to the end of the year, uh, it's it's something like a thirty six percent reduction in, uh, in 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 luminosity in NTL. So you tell me, okay, you've just told me that lights have gone down by by a third. Uh, that doesn't tell me anything, right? I want to know what this actually does to households. Okay, so now let me show you what it does to households, and I'm going to conclude with this. So, in previous work, what we've done is we've done. And there, we're not the only people who've done this. The World Bank has done it. And there's a paper in that I just saw recently. I missed it, actually. I'm uh, embarrassed to say. There's a paper which came out, I think it was in PNAS and Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I shouldn't have missed it. Uh, so, so there's at least three, including ours, poverty maps of, of Gaza. And the poverty mapping of, uh, of, of Gaza... The best that you can do. So uh, we 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 have very good relations with PCBS. So PCBS is the uh, the Palestinian uh, statistical agency, and uh, PCBS carries out household surveys. And for Gaza, the most recent household survey we have is the is it, it, these are called the PEX. PEX is basically the Palestinian household survey, which does the occupied West Bank and uh, and the Gaza Strip. So we have the the, the 2017 PEX survey, and we have the census. Okay, so we and we have the actual census data. Okay, for for all of uh, all of Palestine, for both the occupied West Bank and for and and for the Gaza Strip. And so what we've done is we've done poverty mapping. Okay, so we basically have an estimate. So this is a very specific estimate. We don't have income; we have expenditures. Those of you who work with micro data, you know you know all these issues with expenditures versus versus income. For adult equivalents, it's really important that it's per adult equivalent, especially in Gaza, where you have very large households with a lot of small children. So it's very important that you work per adult equivalent. You know, there are these conversion scales from for, in terms of how many, you know, a child of certain ages, where di different agencies have different conversion scales. The, the PCBS, the Palestinian
Indian Statistical Agency has its own conversion scale, which is what we're, we're using here. But it doesn't, nothing changes if we use like the FAO conversion scale. So what we have done is using poverty mapping, as I explained earlier, combining the census data with the, uh, with the, with the PEX household survey, we have an estimate of the household expenditures per adult equivalent for every single household in Palestine. Okay, so we have that for Gaza. Okay, we then aggregate that up to the locality level. The locality means these municipalities, so for the 33 municipalities in Gaza. Okay, and then we correlate that with nighttime luminosity in 2017. Okay, so this is not perfect. It's the best that we can do given that the last census was done in 2017 and we wanted to have the census and the household survey be from the, from the same year. So that, that's convenient that we have that. So basically the conversion factor, the exchange rate between NTL uh, and US dollars measured in constant, I think we were using, we're using constant, I think these, I think what I'm showing you in this picture, I may be wrong here. If memory serves me correctly, it's uh, it's a one point, it's 1.18 and it's measured in constant 2015 US dollars because all of this stuff is done in Israeli shekels and then we have to convert the stuff from Israeli shekels into in, into US dollars and there's the conversion factor is approximately 1.18. Okay, that's in some sense the exchange rate between nighttime luminosity and uh, household expenditures per adult equivalent. And then when you look when you look at these maps, what they're showing you is by a given date in a given locality, by how much did household expenditures per adult equivalent in that locality go down as a result of the Israeli bombing. So you can see already by, you know, after one week on the 15th of October, you already have some places, that's where they were bombing mainly, look at 7 November. So it's Northern Gaza, which is being bombed. So they've already lost 30% of their household income, okay? By the 26th of November, in places like Gaza City, we're talking like more than 60% of household income, roughly 60% of household income, household expenditures per adult equivalent have already been lost. And as we go further forward, this is what we included in the in the UNCTAD report that came out uh, that came out uh, at the end of January. That came out just like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks ago. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was three weeks ago. It came out. This came out end of January because uh, it, it was it was anyway. It was very difficult to get clearance for this work from the Secretary General of UNCTAD. It's a long story. Well, that's politics. Um, these maps get a lot worse. The new maps that we've done for 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 January for because we only received the January data. In, in, in February, the stuff gets darker and darker. So we're talking about a 60% reduction in a lot of these places in household expenditures per adult equivalent, okay? So this last part, converting the thing, there you need to have household survey data, right? And, and census data. But everything that comes before, that's free. It's all the simply using publicly available data and open source stuff. So let me conclude all of this just by saying that there's an awful lot of other remote sensing remote sensing data, which is out there. Uh, some of you have probably worked with this, 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 this sort of stuff. Uh, if you're interested in agriculture, you have, you, you can do their vegetation indices. We've done work on the occupied uh, West Bank, for example, just to continue with, with, with Palestinian issues uh, using the, the, the enhanced vegetation indices, but you have huge amounts of, of uh of remote sensing data out there this is this is just a sampling uh you know atmospheric data biosphere data the land surface you name it there, there, and all of just about everything is is free it isn't just nasa the european uh, european commission also has some very nice uh remote sensing data data out there and so what what should you what should you have keep as takeaways from uh from from, from this talk um I'd say the first the first thing is that again this is in some sense it may be my sort of my personal preferences. Uh, I find that NTL in particular and remote sensing, but NTL in particular is really really useful when you're dealing with inaccessible areas. So in work that I haven't talked about today, so with my my friends at Ferdi and colleagues in uh, in Burkina Faso, so we've done work. There's the you have the HTTPS there. We've done work uh, on the, the essentially the link between conflict in Burkina Faso uh, and and aid and and or or and, and also between aid and economic activity. In, in some sense, 
the lack of the impact of aid on economic activity. So these are places in Burkina Faso, as you know, where there's 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 a lot of uh, there's there's a lot of rebellion going on in Burkina Faso. There are whole parts of the country which are no longer under uh, government control. Uh, jihadist control part of the country, you still want to be able to say something about these places, right? In terms of what's going on in terms of economic activity. And you don't want to risk the lives of, of survey workers to, to get this information. You can get an awful lot, again, in this case, using using an NTL. So in, in conflict-prone countries, uh, and in general, in countries which have weak statistical systems, I mean, the other day I was I was I was uh, at a at a reception. I was I, I spent part of the evening talking with the uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Madagascar, and he was telling me, "Look, I don't have any disaggregated data. I have to run a central bank, but I have no disaggregated data for my country in Madagascar." I said, well, "Let's let's talk about having GDN support you and uh, and some Malagashi Malagashi researchers and in, in using using NTL." So anyway, inaccessible areas and and countries which have bad or, or underdeveloped uh, statistical systems. Impact evaluation, I've already told you about. I gave you an example of this. It's good at, there's all sorts of macro papers that you could go and like dig deeper into uh, and policy work uh, as well. So what I hope that I've done today is I, I hope that I've convinced you to go out and use NTL. By the way, all of this could not have been done without uh, most of these people, except for one, four of these people are my former PhD students. So Pinyi, uh, who's now at Hangzhou University in China. So she worked with me an awful lot on the, we worked, we're, we continue to work together on the uh, Ashimoglu Johnson Robinson stuff. Rami is a Palestinian, former PhD student of mine. He is one of the people who works in the Palestine unit at uh, UNTAD in Geneva. Uh, Reza, as you can tell from the name, is Iranian. Uh, so he's he's the one who's still a current PhD student of mine at the Graduate Institute in uh, in, in Geneva. Um, Hamad bin Kasmi is not a former PhD or a current. P I, I have sixty six kids. Okay, I have sixty six former PhD students. So that's that's a lot of. I mean, where I was the thesis director, I have a lot of. I have three biological children, but I have sixty six uh, spiritual children. So Mohammed bin Kasmi worked with me for several years on the uh, the INDH impact evaluation in in Morocco and then Daniele Rinaldo is a former PhD student of mine who's an assistant professor soon to be a, an associate professor he's 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 incredibly smart uh, as all of these people are who's at Exeter and if you will apologize I allow me to to say thank you uh, in Arabic and shukran um I, this was sort of this was sort of arab world top heavy it just shows my uh, my my preferences and I'll hand it back to you, uh, Salim, and let me get rid of the screen sharing and back to you. Thank you so much, Professor Arkan. I think it was an excellent presentation. Uh, and uh, I can tell you there are many students here who actually joined to listen to your uh, keynote speech. I'm quite sure there are extremely many presentation and uh, researchers also will be highly benefited. Uh, we have some questions. I'm requesting uh, Professor Vaidhi Mahmood, would you like to come now, sir? Uh, or you would prefer to uh, come towards the end? No, I'm not feeling very well. So but can please. I just uh, uh, yes, of course. without of course. wasting much time? Uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, fascinating. I, I, uh, In spite of my health issues, I, I uh, spellbound, uh, I must confess that I'm completely innocent and ignorant about this area of uh, economic uh, research which is currently going on. Uh, I have some some idea, of, I should, I'll tell you that uh, right uh, in a moment. But uh, congratulations to uh, Professor Jean-Louis Arkand. Can I pronunciation is okay, Arkand? Uh, for taking a one, as, uh, one, your pronunciation is perfect, and you can just call me <laughs> JL. JL is fine. Okay, JL. Uh, um, congratulations for taking over. With GDN for last twenty years, I think. Uh, so um, uh, I think it's in a good hand now. Uh, it was in a good hand. Uh, it's to continue to be so. Uh, um, Salim, thank you for uh, inviting um, JL 
to give this keynote speech and uh, should i also uh, show you this book by just yes, out oh it's, uh, it's uh, i have to read it uh, is the paradox is the bangladesh paradox sustainable edited by selim Raihan Shashwa Bagdiabdan, who is the chairman of the board of GDN, that's why it's relevant to GDN, uh, and Umar Salam. It's about Bangladesh's, whether Bangladesh paradox is sustainable. Uh, I have a question about that just now. Uh, um, and, um, okay, uh, as I said, this is an area where I think our students and our young researchers will be very much interested to take on. Um, right away, um, at the end of your lecture, you were uh, talking about your findings on, uh, on on the war going on in, uh, in that strip. Uh, uh, I was thinking about this will be an excellent evidence uh, before the uh, International Court of Justice, which is uh, going on at this moment. Uh, it traces the, uh, the um, magnitude of um, the uh, devastation of settlement, also the effect of uh, the slight ceasefire, uh, ceasefire periods. I noticed that you you could capture that and also the migration of the population southward. So that's excellent. Uh, okay, about the, um, I can see that this is an enormous, um, uh, uh, this is an enormous opportunity and you say very much about, uh, this is an open source. So that's democratizing the data availability. It's almost like it reminds me of internet, um, when internet, uh, was first available. That was also democratic, democratizing. I mean, uh, everybody having access to internet could have the knowledge in the internet. Uh, the um, I won't go into the. Uh, of course, as researchers, we used uh, um, all the techniques. Uh, I am glad to see that um, you could. Um, uh, you could. Um, step aside the gold standard of research nowadays, the randomization, RCT, by using uh, um, uh, d and &D, difference and difference, and uh, fixed effects, uh, regional fixed effects, and so on, and then getting even um, better results and results which are not possible through RCT. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by your argument about your your work on uh, further work uh, adding this data to uh, the Asimaklu Robinson paper um, by uh, both um, uh, validating also um, also uh, adding something in terms of linearity over time of what was happening to economic growth in these different regions. I can, um, from, I, I think I, I, I looked at one work which, which was about the uh, luminosity relating GDP per capita across countries. There are many, many papers on that, but one paper which attracted me was that uh, um, controlling other variables whether uh, the uh, degree of autocratic rule has creates a deviation from expected uh, expected uh, uh, per capita income, uh, which hints to the reliability of GDP data, and the hypothesis is that that the more autocratic a country is, you will get uh, more than expected GDP. Now, I was looking at the, in the regression, I was looking at the location of Bangladesh. I won't tell you where it is, but you can find it out, whether it's out there. Uh, I, I was thinking of some of the problems in Bangladesh's case. Uh, well, I, th I think um, some intriguing. Uh, I think you, you have said that uh, uh, you have to, I mean, this data can be 
combined with uh, household survey data, more so in countries in remote areas where household survey data are not that available. Bangladesh is, is rich in household survey data. Even then, uh, something we, which we cannot do just by household survey data or census data, I think can be, uh, you can do more uh, with this um, and uh, 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 remote sensing data. One, one, one that readily came to mind as I, as I was hearing to you is uh, whether uh, we, we we get a lot of remittances in rural areas, remittances from workers abroad, and we know by their expenditure pattern that they spend and other things. Uh, uh, this data on illumination, night line illumination, can uh, answer uh, um, the question whether the spending of remittance receiving households can create uh, urban like settlements uh, because of the spending pattern, and that, that we don't know directly from the data which are available. Uh, another question could be about a negative question about uh, uh, where uh, the light is lighting is uh, illumination is not good thing is around Sundarban. We are trying to protect Sundarban area. There's a lot of movements about popular movements about that, and if we can trace that, uh, there is more uh, lighted area, including which will be uh, because of the. Uh, some of the um, um, power, very contested uh, installation of uh, power capacity in the, those areas. Uh, we can we can trace whether the uh, Shindarban area is shrinking uh, by looking at the increasing area of lighted area around it. But uh, more generally, we can uh, think of uh, whether the Government's infrastructure projects uh, are uh, are um, um, are helping or uh, doing the reverse in terms of decentralization of urbanization. It can have both both effect. It can attract to Dhaka or it can decentralize. Uh, um, poverty data can be supplemented by uh, lighted. Uh, illumination data. Uh, I was thinking of one paradox. You, uh, that's why I, I uh, uh, mentioned uh, Salim's uh, Bangladesh paradox book. Is that Dhaka's illumination may present a paradox because all the new there are so many expressways and metro rails in the last few years being built right on top of the main high roads which are busiest and most illuminated at night. Now, <laughs> Dhaka may present a paradoxical picture <laughs> of uh, diminished uh, illumination. <laughs> also, even if Dhaka is progressing as a city. Um, about... Um, uh, I mean, you have mentioned about all the techniques which where the, the elimination can be used as a right-hand variable or as a left-hand variable and identification problem can quite to some extent can be uh, can be resolved. And uh, mm, but, uh, you, you you mentioned uh, I, sh I should because uh, these are our students, uh, many of them and uh, young researchers. I should say even even beyond the uh, uh, night illumination, the um, you have worked yourself. I I suppose uh, I'm sure on the the data itself, whether daytime or nighttime, uh, satellite data use of satellite data for policy making and for uh, economic analysis in Bangladesh, we used a long time ago, and the uh, we we collected the the data on cropped cropped land of paddy area by taking a satellite alternative alternative measure. I mean, all these data are a a, a check on whether the survey data are okay. I mean, it's a good way of many. I mean, yeah.
uh, um, there are many of the, I mean, uh, uh, development problems in terms of environmental protection, like uh, how much wetlands are being lost, uh, how much forest lands are being lost. This will be this will be a different thing. I mean, illumination will will be bad if you see that wetlands and forests are gone. Um, but it will show as uh, GDP growth in terms of the calculation. So that that is almost like when we grow uh, the estimate GDP, we we say that is uh, we should net it out from environmental degradation. I think that literature of uh, how you combine uh, uh, environmental degradation with GDP growth uh, can be something. And for Bangladesh, it's it's utmost important. One of the thing, uh, last thing I will mention is that which is which, which where the data access is not for understandable reasons not open uh, is a uh, mobile phone which uh, uh, you have to for um, personal uh, privacy you have to uh, uh, segregate the data of mobile device and the personal data and then you can see how population movements are in real time and day to day uh, and over time migration and movement states. And there are papers on Bangladesh on this. Uh, my daughter who teaches at Berkeley uh, did a paper with his, her colleagues in, uh, in Harvard on the spread of, um, spread of COVID. Uh, 18, COVID-19 uh, by using the telephone mobile data movements and uh, the access was not open. They had to get permission from the government as well as from the mobile phone. But it showed uh, some very important results how government's uh, decision or lack of decision about whether to close or to reopen the uh, uh, the um, um, factories, the garment factories, uh, how it, uh, uh, it it affected the spread of COVID-19 uh, almost overnight in, in one week or two weeks time to remote areas of Bangladesh. And you could see the movements from Dhaka. Most of the people are from Noakali, Komilda and other things. And the spread of COVID was more to Komilda and initial spread. So I've talked too much. I mean, uh, should I just say that it's a, uh, it's a new area of research for uh, uh, most of us, I think. And you have introduced us with uh, uh, with this uh, this uh, potential, great potential of um, doing more research, doing research which is possible uh, without um, doing an RCT, because nowadays you cannot get a PhD without doing an RCT, so or get, get a get a paper published with that. I'm extremely worried about that. So um, RCT is a very good thing, but it cannot do many things in the, for many other uh, analyzing many problems. So uh, in spite of uh, Abhijit being a very nice, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, still. Um, uh, I'm glad that uh, yeah, you and your colleagues and many other economists have introduced this data to analyze things which uh, are extremely important, policy relevant, and particularly uh, useful for understanding economic development and how it takes place. So thank you very much again, J.L. Arkan, Professor Arkan, we, I hope to see that we will see more of you in coming years. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, all. Salim, thank you for giving uh, me this. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So I think uh, you also raised some questions for Professor Arkan. Uh, Salim, why not uh, uh, the stuff uh, in the chat. respond to some of the questions and then we'll go back to, to some, some of the, the questions. Do you want me to take some of the things in the chat? Yeah, please. Okay, let me let me just go to, go through the the chat. So some of these are easy, some of these are hard. Um, so there's Muhammad Rafiqul Islam. The first thing in the chat asked how the threshold level is determined in RDD. That's a political decision. 
So um, in, in the Moroccan case, they had a certain budget. They knew how many rural communities they could treat, uh, they could provide funding to. And so that's how they came up with the 30% threshold. But in uh, it, it, that's, that's a policy decision. That's not the researcher. As a researcher, you just take that as given. Okay, so that's that's that that's how it's. It, it isn't that it's determined in RDD. It's it's like I don't know. You get admitted to a certain college if you're you know a certain PhD program because your GRE is above a certain threshold, right? You have to be you have to be in the ninety fifth percentile to get into what, whatever program. It's a it's a threshold. It's a policy decision. The second question by uh, uh, Shale Sadiq Khan. Um, th this is sort of a confusion. So NTL is a measure methodology. Okay, uh, so, so those are two different things. So NTL is really a way of measuring economic activity, whereas random forest models you could use. I mean, I'm an economist, so I don't tend to use random forests. Um, people in other social sciences will use random forests, and some economists. I'm not. I'm not criticizing random forests, but those are two different things. The, the third question by Sanup Mandal uh, on how, so I didn't identify the bombing regions, okay? So there, go and look up, the, you'll see in the presentation, there's the reference to the stuff by the people at Oregon State, the good people at Oregon State and, uh, and CUNY. They produce this, this stuff from the Sentinel satellites. Um, and the methodology is very, very, very clearly explained by them and it's remarkable work and then this again is freely available they make this available to the to the international community at a on a it's basically every 10 days or so they have a new map come out um the vegetation data go to the nasa website so this is from farah naz uh how to access the vegetation data you just hunt around on the on the uh on the um on the nasa website you'll you'll find it don't don't worry. There's there's other vegetation. There's European vegetation data which I haven't worked with. Um, I've worked a little bit with the vegetation data. So right now I'm I'm combining uh, remote sensing data with data. I'm, I'm working on cows in Burkina Faso. Okay, because uh, I have some very very nice data on basically on over time on a whole bunch of households. So this is household survey data, and I'm th there's this old literature as a development economist on on. Uh, basically on on livestock as a buffer stock right and 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 basically how peasants use livestock uh they sell livestock when times are bad they'll buy livestock when times are good and and so that that's where i've used the vegetation stuff uh but just go to the go to the go to the website of nasa you'll find all of this stuff and you can download it then how did i calculate the conversion rate of expenditures into ntl so let, i can say that very briefly so uh, but let me just go over what I already said. Um, so we do the poverty mapping, okay, which means that we combine household survey data with census data to come up with, so basically with, with the household survey data, we run a regression. And again, this you can use any methodology you want. Uh, in our new versions, we're, we're basically losing some, using some kind of, we're using a lasso method in our in our new stuff. But in the past, it was, you know, it was just plainly squares. Um where we basically regress household expenditures per adult equivalent on the few variables which are in common in the household survey and in the census. And the, the basic information that's, 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 that's common to the household survey and a census is going to be the type of housing to a large extent, right? It's, is, is, you know, depending upon the country you're looking at, it's going to be, it's, it's basically be the type of flooring, the type of walls, the type of roof. Are you connected to a sewer? Uh, to a sewage system, do you have running water? Are you connected to the electricity grid? Those are the, the that's the type of information that you're going to have both in a household survey and a census. Okay, so we run that on the households in the household survey. We get the coefficients from that regression. Then we take the data from the census, and we plug it, plug in, plug that those data into those coefficients, and we get an estimate with a standard error. We get an estimate of household expenditures for at per adult equivalent for every household, okay? Then we aggregate all of those households up, in this case, to the look, what's known in Palestine as the locality level. So, you know, whatever administrative unit you want, in this case, it's sort of like the equivalent of a municipality. And then we correlate our measure of house, the average household expenditure per adult equivalent. We correlate that with the luminosity in the same locality. Okay, and that's how we get to the, con the conversion factor.
Okay. And and what's what's actually kind of nice about this is whether we do this using very small disaggregated level, right? Sort of at you know, the locality level. Not we've done this not just for Gaza, we've done it for the occupied West Bank as well. I mean, I've done it in for other countries as well. Uh just happened to be focusing on Palestine today. It seems sort of a, a you know, it's it's a topic which is on people's minds these days. Um uh, whether you do it that way or you do it like with macro aggregates, right? When we do it time series, right? So we have like quarterly data on GDP for, for put out by PCBS. And we all know how bad GDP data are in just about every country in the world, right? I mean, if you see how GDP data is constructed, you would stop doing macro immediately, right? It's, it's, it's a real mess, right? But it's the best we have. But actually the conversion factor we get is very similar. It's very, very similar. So that that sort of, I'm not saying that just because you know two wrongs don't make a right, but we sort of basically get the same type of uh, type type of number. Um, I can't help you directly on your thesis, right? But look up all the stuff in R. So this is for Farah Naz again. I can't help you on your thesis. <laughs> I, as I said, I'm a recovering ap- academic. But uh, you know, write to me, and I'm sure I can, I can, I can set you up with some, uh, with you know, some places where you can look stuff on, on look up stuff on, you know, spatial analysis. I go and look at the uh, the CRAN task view, C R A N task view on spatial analysis in R. Okay, so CRAN basically, so CRAN has all of the has all of the R packages uh, organized by theme. So like you know. Time series econometrics, nonlinear stuff, spatial analysis. And what you have for the main packages is you have what, what in R are called vignettes. And the vignettes, when they're well written, they're fabulous. They're like little 20 page summaries of everything you need to know about whatever the technique is that's, that's dealt with in the package. So that's what I would start with. That's sort of that, that's sort of a, a quick and dirty way to, to get into spatial, to spatial uh, uh, analysis. Uh, well, apparently, and, and as, uh, as uh, Wahiduddin uh, said, uh, you know, uh, he was mentioning the the International Court of Justice. Well, our the actually our report for the for the the South Africa uh, case, which we, International Court of Justice, we'd written this report. You'll notice the dates. We'd written this report. And it was blocked. It was. Blocked. Anyway, long story, up until the first sentence of the International Court of Justice, because they didn't want it to be used uh, as uh, as evidence of the International Court of Justice. Anyway, but that, that, that's politics. That, that, I, what, 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 some people who've read this, uh, the biggest compliment I think I was paid on the guy is uh, Geeks Against Ethnic Cleansing. I love that. I have no trouble being called a geek. I'm a geek. Uh, so it was Geeks Against Ethnic and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, that uh, no, the NTL stuff is not enough to attract our world leaders' attention. Um, uh, Bina Pradhan, so you're stuck. Yes, forest products. That's that's again. I am not a forest economist. There's a lot of interesting stuff on uh, on uh, you know on on timber and whatever. I mean, yes, I mean, and there's a whole bunch of stuff on deforestation. There's a lot of satellite data on deforestation. So yes, I would definitely, I would definitely go, go, you know, take, take it. I wouldn't, it wouldn't so much in this case be data. Well, it could be right. Because as you're looking at deforestation, you'd like, you'd like to correlate. So yes, I, I would definitely comment on economic and how that, and also what was, was saying. Right. I mean, in terms of sort of netting out uh, environmental damage. Um, yes, uh, for Aristide Akpa on uh, the smallholder farmers. Again, you just change the left-hand side variable. It's not going to be NTL anymore, right? It's going to be some kind of... Uh, just for all the people who are on... who worked with remote sensing data, NTL itself is not... Okay, so for example, a few years ago, I used to spend a lot of time in China at Renmin University of China in, in Beijing, and I was working with some Chinese colleagues where you uh, and ran into a very interesting issue. Uh, we, we, it turns out as coast cities in China, 
in highways, which are all illuminated, and there's, you know, hectares, thousands of hectares of apartment buildings, they're all illuminated, but there's not a single person there. Okay? So sometimes you get spurious correlation of luminosity activity. And what we realize there is by getting data on uh, WeChat uh, activity. Because in these places where there were ghost cities, there was no WeChat activity. You know, WeChat is the, you know, the, the Chinese sort of WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp has copied a lot of stuff from WeChat, actually. Um, like you have, you're having your, your card as a QR code. That what's that finally said, I think a couple of years ago, WeChat had been doing this for 10 years. Uh, so, so that where NTL, there's a problem, right? So, a more mirror, if you can combine more the problem with getting internet traffic and stuff like that is that's quite often proprietary, data, right? So, you have to have a, you know, if if you think of something like, uh, if you think of something like, it, like mobile, mesh, okay, so video and stuff like that. So, uh, it really, Interesting, again, to look at, you know, the rollout of mobile money in Bangladesh uh, and and how that and, and, and the issue was brought up earlier about remittances. Right. Uh, but one would have to know, one would have to have access to other data. And there's presumably ways, you know, let me, let me just say as a, as a recovering academic, sort of my rule now, if you want to write an interesting paper, if you only have one source of data, it's not going to cut it. You need to merge together, I'd say, at least three different sources of data to be able to write an interesting paper today. So merge together household survey data with census data with satellite data. There you have something interesting to say. If you just use a household survey or just use census data or just use satellite data, you do not have a paper which, is, which you're going to be able to sell. If you can put together several types of data, that's that's going to make your product easier to sell because unfortunately this is this is I'm, I'm glad I'm old and, and and no longer you know a, a junior researcher because the market's really hard out there but if you're a junior researcher you have to do marketing yourselves if it makes it easier right so uh yeah and and satellite data and remote sensing data is is is, is just is just one of them um uh, Nabila, so you're saying specific data from Google. Yeah, I mean, all all, all of this stuff on, on climate, on temperature, uh, on temperature, on, uh, on on rainfall, all of this stuff exists. All of, all of this stuff, uh, all of this stuff exists. So some of this stuff, so Aristide says replication, some of this stuff is already online. Okay, some of, some of this stuff is, is, is already online. And, and eventually once... Once this stuff gets uh, gets so, some of the stuff I can't share because because like the the, uh, the 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 Moroccans don't. But again, you can reproduce all of this. All of my students have reproduced this. I mean, it's just RD with, with with right. So uh, and it's all uh, again. Once we publish, uh, once we publish Aristide, Once we publish the uh, the the Gaza stuff, that'll all be on GitHub. Okay, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, I believe in sharing everything. I mean, that's 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 the point of being an academic or a recovering academic, at least, is to share is to share stuff. Yeah, there's nothing secret going on. Same back to you. No, thank you so much, uh, Professor Arkand. I'm checking if there is any other uh, question uh, from the. But I think you have already uh, uh, answered some very interesting questions, and uh, you know, based on your. Some very interesting things which have been emerged. Uh, so I don't think there is any other question, but uh, uh, then let me thank you, uh, Professor Alton, and our course persons. And uh, I think that kind of uh, skill is needed, how to combine these. And, and you suggested that there are some of the tools are available online. And I think, uh, uh, you know, if you Suggest so some of these tools and I offered uh, your uh, you know, share of these resources too. I think once you share with us, we'll be very happy to share with the participants. So in your presentation, there are already some links. So I request the participants to use those links to download some of the data and all the resources. But in addition to that, I, uh, Professor Arkan can also share with us some of other resources and which Sunim table will be sharing with you. 
uh, through email and other means. Again, I think uh, uh, I must thank Prof. Arkand uh, that uh, uh, I wish and we wish that you were in Dhaka, but we look forward to your visit in Dhaka sometime in the near future. And, uh, and we'll, we'll be hosting uh, one important, important public lecture for you in Dhaka. And yeah, you, the, you, 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 can, you can run, but you can't hide, Salim. I will, I will I'll get to that very soon. Of course, of course, we will. And thank you, sir, Professor Bhadir Mahmoud. Uh, I know that how difficult it was for you, uh, but uh, you shared your views with us. And I think uh, we were immensely benefited from your uh, listening to you. So with this, uh, we can uh, close this session for today. Uh, participants, you know that we have two full day sessions tomorrow and day after our conference. And uh, it's a heavy loaded. Uh, 74 papers will be presented. There are three panel sessions. There are three uh, special sessions. And uh, there will be more than 200 participants uh, will be attending in person the conference. So I look forward to your participation. I know that some of you will be joining online and look forward to seeing you uh, uh, tomorrow in the conference. So with this, uh, I uh, conclude this session. And thanks once again to Professor Arkin. Bye then. Thank mm -hmm. you.